Hello and welcome to Rice Chapel. My name is Tani and I'm the Director of Connection Ministries. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you haven't already, we'd like to ask you to type in your name and the name of those worshiping with you in the comments section. If you're worshiping with us today via YouTube, we're hoping that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're worshiping with us today via Facebook, we're hoping that you will like and share today's service with others. As always, if you have questions about Rice Chapel or you'd like to learn more about its ministries, feel free to reach out to me directly at tanya at ricechapel.org or you may call or text me at 540-604-0038. Thanks again for worshiping with us today and may God bless you as Clay leads us into a song of praise. I'm Clay Motley, the music director at Wright's Chapel, and I'm inviting you to join us in singing out loud these next few songs we're going to do. So whoever you got with you, watch the words on the screen, sing it as loud as you can, dance if you want to dance, engage with us, have fun with us, and let's do some songs together. Welcome to Rice Chapel. It is so good to be in worship with you this day, wherever it is, whenever it is you're worshiping with us. We, uh, we, we thank you and, and pray that you uh, will feel your heart growing closer to God as God draws near to you. Uh, my name is Charles. I am the pastor here at Rice Chapel. And again, thank you for making the time uh, to, be, uh, to be in worship. I want to give a shout out to 
to Jason and Lori Smith, who've been worshiping with, worshiping with us now for a little bit from, from down in Warsaw, Virginia, and good to have them um, as a part of our community. If, if you're in our area and have been worshiping with us online, we'd love to meet you in person. Um, love to have you stop by either for worship one Sunday morning at 8.30 or 9.45 or just uh, during the week. We'd love to meet you um, and see you uh, in person as well and hope that you'll, you'll consider, consider that. Uh, with this service, I hope that uh, um, if this service is, is meaningful to you, enjoyable to you, that you'll share this service uh, uh, as well uh, so that your friends, family um, can um, can, can uh, worship with us. It's, it's how we grow the church. Um, it's how we share the gospel of, of, of Christ. Just uh, one announcement. I want to invite you to, to get on your calendar if you, if you are in our area uh, or could make plans to be in the area for April the 16th. Uh, we're going to have a potato drop here at the church. We'll have about 20,000 uh, pounds of sweet potatoes out in our front parking lot that at 9.45, we'll start bagging up on that Sunday morning, on that Sunday after Easter, and giving out to folks in the community. We will be having worship online uh, for those who are not able to, to be here. But uh, if you're able, we'd love to, love to meet you and have you um, join us for that, for that day of service um, as we worship through service on the 16th. Uh, with that, I want to invite you, if you haven't checked in yet, to go ahead and check in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. You can do so by typing your name and the names of any of those in the room with you in the, in the comment section. As you see others who have checked in, I want to encourage you to, to greet them with, uh, with the love of Christ. Um, and also, as we move into a time of prayer, I want to invite you, if you have any prayer requests, to share those prayer requests in the comment section. Uh, we want to be in prayer and ministry, in prayer and ministry with you. Let us then prepare to go to God in prayer. Hi, my name is Elijah. Let us pray. God of great love, take hold of our hearts and let us sit here in the stillness of your presence as we turn our souls to you. Inspire us, God, to turn ourselves inside out in service to you. As we clean our homes, commute to our offices, work in our gardens, sit at our desk and answer our emails, may we honor you. As we read to our children, greet our neighbors, jog on the road and shop in the stores, may we honor you. At work or at play, take hold of our hearts, O oh God, and awaken us to the presence of your love. May our love spill over into our lives in such a way that we will lighten the path and ease the burdens of each person we meet. Help us where we can, to, where we can to be. Help us where we can to be instruments of your healing and to be beacons of hope. To those who in despair open our minds and our hearts to see those who are excluded and to be intentional inviting them into our home, into our circle of friends, and into friendship. With Christ, humble us so that we see the image of God in each person we meet. We pray in the name of the one who came as the light of the world, Jesus, the Christ, who taught us uh, to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises of Christ alone, bound to Him eternal. 
daily by love's strong cold, overcoming daily with my spirit soul, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. that cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Hello, my name is Tinsley. Today I'm reading Luke 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had edema, and Jesus asked the experts in the law and Pharisees, Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not. When he noticed how the guests choose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. Once the dinner guest, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time of the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they, all unlike alike, began to make excuses. Uh, let me say thank you to all of those who have helped to lead our worship this day. Let us, let us pray together. O oh Lord, break the bread of life that in so doing we may be better able to hear, better able to understand, and thus better able to respond. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in our, our fourth week of this worship series entitled Breaking Bread with Jesus. And we've been looking at the meals that Jesus hosted or was a guest at in the Gospel of Luke. And we've said that on 10 different occasions, um, Jesus gathered around a table to share in a meal. And on each of those occasions, Jesus shared a lesson about life in the kingdom of God. In today's meal, Jesus is again a guest at the home of a Pharisee. Um, Pharisee was a Jewish religious leader. There were about 6,000 um, Pharisees in Jesus' day. Uh, Pharisees were, were biblical experts. They were trained and educated in uh, religious law. They, um, they, quite frankly, they were model Jewish believers. Um, Jewish mothers and fathers um, hoped and prayed that their sons would grow up to, to be Pharisees one day. Uh, but the Pharisees and, and Jesus often butted heads uh, when it came to uh, religious norms and, and customs. Um, the Pharisees and, and Jesus often differed in their biblical interpretation and, and who they thought God favored and, and who they thought God did not favor. <laughs> Jesus looked at Jewish religious law and people, uh, people in general really, differently than the Pharisaic traditions um, had been taught. And quite frankly, you read much of Luke's Gospels, and, and, and you begin to think that the Pharisees must have been a glutton for punishment. Uh, because those Pharisees, they just keep inviting Jesus into their home for meals. And, and you think about it, Jesus is so smart. Jesus is so clever. I mean, Jesus, he, he is the Son of God. And over and over and over again, Jesus seems to just keep putting those Pharisees in their place. Have, have you ever had to put together a guest list for an event? 
What's an event uh, that you had to put a guest list for? Maybe it was for your kid's birthday party. What did, maybe it was for a wedding. Maybe it was for someone. So, okay, uh, what, what's a, uh, an event you had to put a guest list? Go ahead and comment in the comment section if you're comfortable. Uh, type that in. We're curious. What, what, what uh, events have you had to have a guest list for? You ever had to figure out, like, who to invite uh, to join into the fun? Or, or maybe worse yet, right, you had to figure out who you were not going to invite um, to a party or to a dinner or to a, to a social occasion. And I just tell you, if you've never had to do that, um, let me tell you, setting up a guest list, that can be a stressful endeavor. <laughs> Have you ever been involved in, in, in planning a wedding? And you're going to have a, a sit-down dinner reception and you're on a budget? <laughs> You, you got some. You got some difficult decisions to make. Um, you know, are are children going to be included in this, or is this just an adult affair? How how far out on the family tree are you going to go with invitations? Uh, do do you put your your crazy aunt or uncle on the list, or do you leave them off? Because because don't we all have a crazy aunt or or uncle? And some of you right now are thinking to yourself. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a crazy aunt or uncle. Well, that is, that is probably because you're it. <laughs> um, you know, when you, when you have to make a, a guest list, there are, there are all sorts of, of, of tough calls that you have to make. Can, can your young cousin bring his new girlfriend? If not, um, well, then what about Aunt Judy, who's, who's been with her fella for several years, but still not married. <laughs> How do you say no to one and yes to another? What, what friends, what co-workers are going to be included? And, and what folks, in leaving them off the list, are you notifying that you're really not um, as close as they might have thought? <laughs> the last few years, you add in, you add in COVID and and there was a whole new way to offend family and friends with, with vaccination statuses and, and who could come. I tell you, years ago when, when my wife Amy and I were, were getting married, we just, we just took the easy route. <laughs> and we decided we weren't, we weren't going to do any sit-down uh, dinner at our, at our wedding reception. Just, just some hors d'oeuvres and finger food, punch and a cake and Quite frankly, it seemed the easiest and to make the most sense for us. And it got us out of having to make a guest list. <laughs> my my father-in-law father um, was a pastor of a, of a pretty good-sized church at that time. Amy and I were, were really involved in our church there in Richmond City. And, and so we basically just gave an open invitation. Church, family, friends, work folks... <laughs> Hey, we're, we're getting married, and if you'd like to come, um, you're invited. Huh? If, you, if you can't come, if you choose not to come, um, please know we are not offended, and we still, we still like you and consider you our friend. <laughs> hosting events, I'm telling you, hosting parties, it is work. <laughs> hosting your, your kid's birthday party can be, can be stressful. So-and-so invited your kid to their party. Are you now obligated to return the, the invite, even if your child doesn't really like, like them? I'm telling you, we, we, we never knew what to do with, um, with Sophia's birthday party. Sophia is our, is our daughter who is disabled in a variety of ways. And, and I'm telling you, as she got older, she, she, didn't have, she didn't have a lot of friends her age. And Sophia just wasn't... She wasn't capable of friendship in the same way that kids think about having friends over. But, but Sophia, she had a lot of adult friends. She had church folks and community folks who were so kind and so caring to her. And, and they felt close to Sophia and they loved her. But, but Sophia couldn't, couldn't tell you who she wanted to have come to her party. I mean, depending on what was on, what was on her mind, Sophia, she might invite Sean and leave me off the list. Uh, um, so Amy and I, we, we tried for a few years to, to invite a, a few folks over to the house for Sophia. We, sometimes we invite some folks to go out to Mexican for her birthday. But, but quite frankly, we found that 
whatever we did, some folks, they got their feelings hurt. And COVID actually relieved some of the pressure <laughs> because we just started doing a really small family party with, with Grandpa and Molly. Even, even this year, um, Sophia's birthday party, I think that's probably the last party we've had at our place, and it was very pleasant. I don't know how you are. I'm, I'm always relieved <laughs> when certain social gatherings that we've hosted are over and, 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 and things went well. I mean, some of you, you know how it is. You, you plan for a nice event, and it always seems that stuff happens, right? Sometimes Jesus even decides to show up. And, and Jesus can make everything and everyone a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> Jesus was famous for, for showing up at a dinner and, and saying the wrong thing, offending the host, the cooks, the guests, you, you name it, right? More than once in, in Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus was at a dinner and people end up leaving the dinner annoyed and, and with a bit of heartburn. <laughs> here, on, here on this occasion, Jesus has been invited um, to a, a nice man's house, a religious leader's man's house for dinner. Uh, Jesus wasn't in the, in the place for two minutes before he launched into a bit of a rant about his fellow guests and how they were jockeying for position at, at the table. Then having offended um, some of the guests, Jesus uh, goes on to hammer the host for the nature of his, of his guest list. Why do you invite only those folks who can invite you back? Jesus asked his host. You, you should have invited those who are so poor they can't, they can't invite you back. Invite those who don't have the resources. Invite those who don't have the means to reciprocate your, your generosity. You'll be blessed, said Jesus, because they can't repay you. Now, I... I don't know how many of us actually do that. <laughs> like, frankly, I know when I, when I think about inviting someone over for supper for house or for my party, my, my first thought is not usually whether that person is then going to invite me over in return. I would say that my motivation is usually more pure um, than that. But I would also have to admit that, that most of the folks that I do invite into my circle all have the means to reciprocate my invitation. I would have to admit that I simply don't have that many folks that I know who are so poor that they couldn't return my hospitality. And that, in and of itself, is a challenge to me from this story. It is a challenge to my life of faith where I have to ask myself, why are all my friends so much like me in so many ways? Jesus here is forcing me to ask myself, with what kind of people have I chosen to surround my life with and why? He forces me to ask myself, how have I reached out to the poor, to the maimed, to the disabled, and sought not to just offer acts of charity, but to also offer my friendship to those who have no ability to repay. And, and I'll admit, truthfully, sometimes it, it can feel a little bit uncomfortable to, to have to look in the mirror and to ask those questions of my own life. But they should be good questions. They can be good questions. Questions that we should ask ourselves. And they are questions that we should ask ourselves as a church. And, and hear me, I, I know we come to church on Sundays not to be confronted, not to be made to feel uncomfortable. But we come with the expectation that we will get to be with Jesus. And we like to sing that song, What a friend we have in Jesus, what a buddy, what a pal. Or, or at our more contemporary service, we sing, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, he calls me friend. And, and, and that's true. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend. And, and so perhaps in worship, we, we hope for a little bit of polite conversation, a little bit of give and take with the Lord, a, a joke between us. 
But here in this story at the Pharisee's house, the table is dominated by Jesus doing all the giving and the guests and the hosts doing all the taking. And just imagine if if you were to invite me, the preacher, to your home for dinner and you, you spend most of the day preparing the meal, and I show up, and, and no sooner has the food been served, and I ask, you know, why, why didn't you invite some of the, the homeless folks who are living down in the hotels in Carmel Church to your home tonight? Uh, they need this food more than I do. I dare, dare say a, a comment like that could lead to a, a bit of, of an uncomfortable evening, couldn't it? <laughs> it? It seems to me that the job of the guest is to graciously receive the hospitality of the host and not to make judgments on the quality of the host's hospitality. And yet, that's just what Jesus does. Without being asked to share his wisdom with those at the table, without anyone requesting his instructions and judgments, Jesus instructs and and Jesus judges. You remember when, when, when Jesus said, Do not judge or you too will be judged. That's what Jesus told his disciples. Jesus told them it's wrong for you to judge one another. But maybe here Jesus is saying you are not permitted to judge one another. You are not permitted to position yourself above one another. However, I can can judge. Maybe what Jesus is really saying is is do not judge unless you are God's son. But truthfully, we should be thankful for Jesus' judgment in our lives. For Jesus judges and corrects us in his love. You, You think about it, it's an unloving parent who refuses to make judgments about their children's behavior. No no self-respecting mother ever said to a child, I love you just the way you are. Act as you please. Any way you live your life is fine with me. Promise me you will never change a thing. No. In in love, parents become judges. They they say yes and they say no. They, they, They love their children enough to teach them right and wrong. They generously give Uh, guidance, instruction. They they give advice whether their children ask for it or not, and they offer guidance whether those children want their guidance or or not. Well, so did Jesus. Jesus came to us not only saying, I love you, uh, but also saying something, "I, I want you to be a part of my movement into the world. Jesus loves us enough to call us and to say, follow me. But then Jesus says, here's the direction you need to walk if you want to be my disciple and follow me. To walk in this Christian life, Jesus asks us some tough things, some things that may make us uncomfortable. And Jesus is not afraid to challenge our ways of living Ways that we may think are good, ways that we've grown accustomed to, ways that we are comfortable with. And yet Jesus expects us to make some changes and to live differently. And that's not always easy. The way Jesus describes it, the kingdom of heaven is like a party with with people whom most of us wouldn't be caught dead with on a Saturday night. You know, one of the the things I've I've heard and I've said and heard others bemoan in our culture today is what seems to be a lack of respect for each other. Uh, There seems to be a lack of respect, we we say, for people in positions of authority, a a total disrespect of of those with whom we may disagree on on any number of issues. And and respect is a a wonderful practice, and and I, I firmly believe we need to figure out how to act in ways that are respectful and ways that lead to, to dialogue. And, and some may even suggest that Jesus here in this passage was being very disrespectful to the other guests and to the hosts. 
But what I believe here in this story that Jesus is actually critical of are actually the things that we have come to respect the most. See, being respectful of others is good, but in so many different ways, we teach our children to respect the very opposite of what Jesus and the kingdom of God suggest. We in our culture, our schools, our society, we teach our children to have respect for money, power, strength, academic and athletic success. Well, we're taught to respect those who have a great deal of influence and power over us. We are told to respect those who, who win and those who have the power to make decisions that affect our lives. And we, and we learn to respect those things and those people because showing respect in this way helps us get ahead in life. And I'm not saying that that is, that is bad to have respect for those with power or money. But what so often happens, it seems, is that in respecting those people, too often we, we disrespect those who don't have those things. Jesus said, blessed are the poor. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Jesus said, blessed are those who weep. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are reviled and persecuted for my sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The very ones that we might look down upon with our disrespect, Jesus holds up. So what are we to do? I don't have a lot of answers for us today. Because these words of Jesus at this meal are tough. And they challenge me like I hope they challenge you. I do know this, however. I do know this, for I felt it. Um, I've experienced it. I've lived it. That if we do, just like Jesus says to do at this meal, and if we do, and if we invite into our circle those that no one else will, we will be blessed. For a number of, of years now, we've had a relationship um, through a mission organization um, with a doctor in Haiti. And we have worked with him trying to provide housing and sustenance uh, for a group of disabled women in Haiti that, that he um, has worked with over the years. Because of, um, because of recent political turmoil in Haiti, we've been able to go, um, we haven't been able to go there in, in several years, but prior, um, over an eight-year period, we, we made three trips to the southern city of Lakai and helped Jano, this doctor, to build a simple but functional home for 12 disabled women who, who still currently um, live there. From what I've read, learned, and, and seen disabled women in Haiti are about as low on the social ladder as, as anyone can get. Um, in Haitian culture, um, in general, women are not seen as equal with men. And, and that is changing and that is improving in certain areas, especially in the cities. But in more rural areas, like, like we were, women still face um, tremendous disadvantages and, and struggles. Any disabled person in Haiti is going to face tremendous challenges. Roads, sidewalks, if there are any, um, elevators, you can forget it, buildings, bathrooms, vehicles, they're just, they're simply not accessible. On top of all that, many in Haitian culture still view a person with a disability as having been cursed by God. Or else they believe that God is cursing the family with a disabled child. These women we were working with and befriending in the southern city of the Klai, in some cases they had been abandoned by their own families. I think about our time there, and there are so many things about our time in Haiti that I could point to where I, where I, saw, the face, where I saw the face of Jesus. 
But if I had to point to just one highlight of, of all of our trips, for, for me it would be the dinner that we took our young female disabled friends to. To most of us from Rice Chapel, it wasn't anything fancy. Chicken and fries in a styrofoam container. The, the, the cold Coke was, was nice. None of us ordered it off the menu. We all had the same thing. Sean had ordered it for us in advance. It, it was a restaurant in downtown Lakai. Most of us um, on our Rice Chapel team, we, we didn't give much thought to it. We were, we were just getting something to eat. Uh, we were dressed in our shorts, our T-shirts, sneakers. But those young disabled women, Brittany, Jacqueline, Sophia, the other women, oh, they came dressed. They wore their finest. For many, if, if not all of them, it was their first time ever being in a restaurant. I, I sat across from a, a young woman, Sophia, who, who couldn't contain her excitement, couldn't contain her smile, and just kept saying thank you. I don't know all of Sophia's disability. She, she, she can walk, although she has a very awkward uh, gait. And my wife, Amy, assisted her through the restaurant and, and held on to her going up and, and down the stairs. Her hands are twisted, uh, but she adapts. And I'll tell you, she, she held that bottle of Coke with her two gnarled hands as if it was the finest wine ever served. We went in there early evening, and the restaurant was crowded. Most of the patrons, a lot of the patrons, were downstairs. Music was playing. It was a very lively atmosphere. The room the restaurant had reserved um, for us was actually upstairs. It, uh, it was the, uh, the VIP room. It had its own air conditioning unit. Uh, we had our own waitress. And truthfully, I really hadn't given any thought to it until I noticed all of the folks downstairs staring at us as we walked past. And maybe they were, were staring because their restaurant was being invaded by a whole bunch of, of white Americans. But I'm not sure that was it. I think rather the stares came because there were a whole group of young disabled Haitian women who were walking arm in arm with us and being held up by us. And in some instances, young Haitian disabled women who were literally being carried in the arms of others through the restaurant and carried up the stairs to the VIP section. I don't know all that went through um, the minds of the patrons downstairs, and I, and I don't know that, that the spectacle caused any of them to, to think or reflect upon their culture or their own views or treatment of disabled women. But I do know this, that if only for a brief moment, there was a group of young disabled women in Haiti who had been lifted up. They had been made to feel as though they were special and that they mattered. And they knew that they were with a small group of Christians, if only but for a short time that loved them and cared for them and saw them as the children of God that they are. If asked to describe that night in just one word, I, I can't say for sure what those young disabled Haitian women would say, but, but I know that Sophia, who sat across from me the whole time, and what I saw in her face and what I thought I heard her say was blessed. 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 I, I, I know that's what I felt in that moment. I felt blessed. And it is a feeling that I will never forget. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, said Jesus. And you will be blessed. I know I was blessed to be in that restaurant on that night. And it had nothing to do with chicken or fries or cold Coke or air conditioning. 
And it had everything to do with Sophia and Brittany and Jacqueline and even Jesus, who I know was present at the table. Friends, at the very heart of our journey of faith, at the very heart of our journey, must be an unwavering commitment to always listen to God's whisper of invitation so that we are ready to meet people and bless people, to serve people, in order that we both experience the love and the joy and the blessings of our Lord. Peace and amen. Again, let me say thank you for all the gifts you give to Life Our Church that just allow us to do so much ministry in, in, the, name, in the name of Christ. And I uh, uh, had a chance to, to, to spend a little bit of time this week with some of our high school kids um, that come over from, uh, from the high school and, and uh, get job training and, and, and do work here from the special ed department. And um, just a wonderful program that we've been able to partner with the, with the schools on, um, that they get some, some workplace skills and janitorial skills and, and that. And, and they're, now coming, they're now coming here three days a week. Um, uh, and it's been a, a great program for them and a great program for, for us and, and our church. And, and I thank you for the gifts you give um, that you send in, that you mail in, that you, um, that you drop off at the church that allows us to do these kinds of things and these programs um, that we wouldn't be able to do without, without um, the, the money that you give. So thank you um, for allowing us to, to, to do those things. Let me share then in, this, um, in, in the final benediction, and then Clay will lead us into a song of praise, that we might go forth into this world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good and render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor every person, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the powers of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thousand stories in one day. Think you're like an anchor, tender whisper of love. The dead of night, you tell me that you're pleased and that I never. You're a good, good
explain 